Hello, everybody. Um, this is Tom Hackle uh, with Goldmail, and um, excited to have this uh, thought leader webinar today with Christoph Morin from SalesBrain. And it is a unique time, and I apologize for that, but uh, we really wanted to schedule this uh, webinar. We think it's one of the more important webinars we've ever done. And it just happened that with our schedules, this was the time that we could uh, really work out. So it is it is late in the afternoon on a holiday weekend. So hopefully this really leaves you all on a, I think it's going to be a very, very high note um, uh, getting into the weekend. And hopefully uh, you'll have some time to really reflect on it. Um, what I wanted to do before I introduce Christoph and have him formally go through this presentation is just say a couple of words. First off, I met, uh, I met Christoph almost seven years ago. Um, and he was, they had already published their book. Uh, they were starting to do some incredible things with, with companies in terms of um, this, this ideology, this methodology that you're going to hear about with neuromarketing. And it was riveting stuff then. What, what I've found here, though, over the years of the refinement and the implementation of this is the practicality of this in terms of what it will do for you, what it will do for your messaging, and how you will think not just about presentations, but how you interact with people to get you get what you wanted to get done, which is getting your message heard and most importantly responded to. Um, it's engaging stuff. It's incredible, and there's a lot here. So uh, you know, brace yourself, sit back, uh, get that cup of coffee, and really stay focused on it. You're going to find this engaging. And without further ado, I want to introduce Christoph to to again go through what is something that I think will change everyone's thinking about how they market and how they communicate. So Christoph, uh, we look forward to a great webinar. Thank you, Tom. Well, good afternoon to all of you, and uh, uh, welcome to this webinar. We're going to discuss a, a very exciting topic, which has been uh, the subject of my fascination for now uh, nearly 10 years. But more importantly, I want this to be uh, valuable to you and giving you incentives and insights um, to apply uh, many of the uh, principles that I'm going to uh, share with you today. The, the basic idea behind neuromarketing is, is quite simple. Uh, you do want to understand how buyers, uh, uh, people you're trying to influence, make decisions. And for decades, we have uh, believed that we need to understand people primarily to predict their buying behaviors. I'm going to suggest to you that we need to understand the brains of people. So neuromarketing is a, a paradigm shift. You could say it's, it's sort of a revolution uh, among marketers who have, I think, gradually begun to understand that uh, marketing as we know it is dead. And there is urgency in integrating uh, new knowledge on the brain and new uh, discoveries on the biological basis of how we effectively produce decisions. It's not about just marketing anymore. It's truly about uh, neuromarketing. Now, there's been attempts over the last decades to try to understand how we respond as consumers without participation, without having to say anything. Um, and you can do that, for instance, from decoding facial expressions. And I assume some of you are familiar with uh, the TV show Lie to Me. And, and you do understand that uh, we uh, have a, an ability to code what our facial expressions uh, do mean. We also have the ability to understand if stress or specific emotions are affected, affecting our voice. And there's been a number of interesting studies around uh, recording and uh, studying algorithm from voice. It's called voice layering. There's also quite uh, a lot of excitement around the ability to uh, understand how consumers respond by looking at the way the gaze, the eyes, will pay attention uh, to specific uh, areas of a screen or area of a packaging. And you may be familiar with some of those uh, heat map that give uh, interesting uh, clues 
on where our eyes are most uh, uh, going and deductions are being made based on that as to the effectiveness of certain uh, visuals and, and graphics. Uh, I have to tell you though that none of those technologies I believe are are what you need to find the right you know the right uh, mechanisms uh, by which you can begin to better understand if we indeed have buy buttons in the brain and and where where they would be so I have for the last 10 years uh, intensively investigated ways that go beyond anatomy beyond just knowing brain areas but trying to understand um, what happens really in the brain and being able to see activity in the brain as a result of a particular stimulus. That stimulus, by the way, can be your own uh, sales pitch, it could be uh, an ad, it could be uh, a print ad or, or, or a video ad, or it could be even a, a billboard. This uh, equipment I'm showing you is today the most widely used equipment uh, among scientists to investigate brain functioning particularly because um, it provides the ability to understand how energy is used inside the brain. And to make all of this much easier on your own brains, I'm going to do a little experiment and it will take just a few minutes. So I'm going to predict what your brain will do uh, in front of seeing this particular uh, piece of advertising from Southwest Airlines. For most of you, the gaze would go straight to the top of the page and you would begin to recognize that these four objects have something in common. They belong to uh, a, a sports related category. Uh, your brain will also very quickly recognize the fifth object which is not congruent, it's an airplane, but your brain is wired to logically try to see if you can put all these objects into one category and you can't. They all fly in space at a particular speed. What I've just described is part of what's called cognition in your brain. A number of computations that are performed extremely quickly and rather than interviewing people or looking at where their eyes go, there is now the ability through the functional MRI to see what cognition means in the brain. No wonder we can get you to the game on time. There's a, a, certainly a, a bit of humor um, in that particular close and humor translate into what is typically referred to as an affective process, ways by which we feel in a certain way, either attracted or somewhat disengaged from a piece of advertising. So what I'm going to suggest to you is there is in fact now the ability to understand both cognitive and affective processes in the brain. And before I show you what your brain would predictably look like in front of this ad, I'm going to show you another ad. It's for the same airline, but uh, as I'm sure you'll begin to quickly realize, it will require a different cognitive and affective process in your own brain. So let's see. Let's see what would be your brain like if I put you into a functional MRI. In front of the map ad, um, this is the kind of information you're able to generate through a functional MRI. The blue and orange squares represent either a high or low level of energy uh, consumption by the brain. Blue actually represent shutdown below a certain level and orange represents a, an increase. So you have the ability through this technology to begin to instantly image in which areas of the brain there is more activity. Uh, you can see the contrast from this second ad and it would take quite a bit more time than I have today to explain precisely what information you gain from this but it does tell you in many ways within just a few seconds which areas of the brain have been successfully uh, excited if you will um, in, way, in, in, in ways that were not possible before. You no longer need to ask people's participation you're able to see directly inside their brain. The excitement around functional MRI, at least from a research standpoint, is quite legitimate because it is used so widely around the world. It's not as uh, easy, though, as to use another piece of technology that neuromarketers have 
um, adopted quite widely, which is called EEG. When you use an EEG, you're no longer able to record the metabolization or use of energy in the brain. You can uh, look at the, the brain waves, the electrical current that is produced when our neurons are active. And uh, progress has been made so that we no longer need to necessarily use these kind of awkward uh, helmets, but we can use a simpler helmet that uh, generates information about brain waves. So I'll show you the same uh, sort of recording we were able to perform on, this, on those two ads. And you're, you're certainly not able to access as much information with an EEG, particularly because you're only measuring the surface activity of the brain. But you can measure frustration and excitement, which in this particular case, as you can see, the EEG experiment that we did did confirm that the, the ad showing the, the sports-related objects uh, managed to get better effectiveness across the board. So you must be wondering at this point, yes, this is all very exciting, but can I afford neuromarketing research? And in many ways, the sad reality is you may not, because it does uh, cost quite a bit of money to put people into a functional MRI or, or have them uh, wear helmets. If you're in a business-to-business -business activity, you may also quickly recognize that it's not terribly uh, convenient, if not uh, appropriate. But what we did and, and have done for the last 10 years is continue to investigate collect and, and, and integrate, if you will, all those good um, findings coming from the neuroscientific community into a set of principles, best practices, if you will, that you can apply as early as tomorrow or Tuesday at this point for most of you uh, to, to make what you do to influence, to persuade, to sell much more effective at the level of the brains of your customer. And if you're marketing beyond um, uh, you know, North America, you will, I think, be very excited to know that this, these principles, these best practices, have been proven to work um, uh, beyond borders uh, because they actually tap into the way we are wired biologically speaking. We've actually done work in more than 20 countries, and we've trained uh, nearly 30,000 people, executives, about 8,000 CEOs, to these principles. We do know that they work regardless of the country you're operating in. Uh, the work is not just uh, theoretical. Uh, we have seen organizations such as the American Marketing Association and the Advertising Research Foundation most, most recently uh, recognize the validity of what uh, work is uh, suggesting in terms of how you can approach your, your markets. And, and some of our customers have uh, used these principles all over the world. But uh, in order for you to understand what those principles are, I, I still need to go over some brain-related information. And you should know, because this is an important aspect of how you begin to understand uh, the brain and responses in the brain, that we don't have one brain. We actually have three. The top part of the brain, the top layer of the brain, is called the new brain or the neocortex. It has considerably uh, uh, been bigger, gone bigger over the last 200,000 years. And we've added a lot of cognitive abilities. This is truly what you could call our thinking brain. And certainly, uh, when we consume, when we make decisions, we use this brain to think a lot about uh, what decision um, has already been actually produced. So we've dis discovered that this brain is used mostly to rationalize. And it is not the part of the brain that becomes as crucial as other areas, which is why I need to introduce what is just right below. In the middle section of the brain, you have the area that we use the most to mediate uh, our effective response. The way we feel is essentially managed by this part of the brain. It's also known as the mammalian brain, but because all mammals have uh, a limbic system or a middle brain. But right below, as important as feeling is when we make decisions, is the true center of decision making. It happens to be the oldest part of the brain. It's known as the reptilian complex. It is also the part of the brain that is functionally, functionally uh, specialized in 
making sure we survive, making sure we breathe, making sure we have proper digestion. Uh, it is a part of the brain that will respond in a fight or flight situation. It is indeed that part of the brain that we could call instinctual. So when we discovered this organized view of the brain, it became quite clear that a lot of attempts to persuade fail because they try to go from the neocortex that is the part of the brain that we use to massage information, produce a lot of calculation, very complicated sentences, because it is indeed through the use of the cortex, the neocortex, that we can uh, uh, use language the way we have, particularly the, the, the written form of language, which has only been around 5,000 years. All of that capability is neocortex-centric. And therefore, when you use that style, that cortex style, to convince or sell, you're directly uh, violating the model that we have uh, identified because you're trying to convince from cortex to cortex when, in fact, the first part you need to influence is indeed the reptilian brain. For the reptilian brain, complex sentences such as we're one of the leading providers of integrated mission critical services, which um, as most of you will recognize are some of the sentences you can see on your websites, are like a foreign language to the reptilian brain. So a little bit as if I would do this to all of you. Je vais commencer à vous parler en français et à moins que vous ayez eu des cours de français, vous ne pouvez pas comprendre ce que je vous dis. Uh, for some of you, many I assume, what I just said was foreign. And that is exactly what we discovered is the problem in attempts to sell or persuade. You will not excite that reptilian preverbal brain, and you will, in fact, worse, get emotional responses that signal disengagement, boredom, and will turn people into this mode we all know how to produce, which is called the pretend mode, where well, you don't have the luxury of losing people's attention in just a few seconds. You have to gain it in a few seconds, and the only way you can do that is by actually producing messages that are reptilian friendly. So, how do you do that? Well, the good news is, uh, if some of you know French or any other language, you know it's pretty hard to, to master. Uh, this particular language we call the reptilian brain language has only six grammar rules. So quickly, I'm going to tell you what it takes to create a sentence that is immediately uh, capturing the attention of the reptilian brain. First of all, that sentence must be using self-centeredness as a core principles. We are fundamentally at the level of the reptilian brain uh, species that must do anything we can to survive. That's why if you talk too much about your company, your products, or even yourself, you're going to disengage the reptilian brain. The reptilian brain wants to know and understand what is the value of what you do uh, within seconds. We recommend, for instance, the use of a very simple technique, which is the you language. Why is you the most influential word in English? Because it draws the audience immediately at the center of the uh, preoccupation or attention. The second uh, grammar rule is that you must understand that the reptilian brain is wired to only act upon disruption, to only act upon a poten potential threat to a state of balance we call the state of homeostasis. In a world where we have this barrage of ads, of attempts to get our attention, we simply don't have the uh, ability to process neutral messages. Going back to that one message I mentioned earlier, we are one of the leading providers. If you just suggest that you're one of many, you have lost already the attention of the reptilian brain. You must find ways to differentiate and to cut through the noise. And we have a number of recommendations that uh, are essentially centered around the need to disrupt, um, to create the gap, to create the contrast. The third principle, which is absolutely critical, is the fact that the brain is actually uh, wired to conserve, to conserve energy. You see, even though um, your brains are, you know, about three pounds, two percent of your body mass, they consume, they burn 
uh, nearly a quarter of your entire energy. And I like to say that we have green brains because I discovered that the brain has all kinds of you know, biological strategies to put us into a conserve mode. What this means is we are actually not wired to kick in a lot of the cortex, to spend a lot of energy, to burn a lot of oxygen and glucose in those areas of the brain that are you know, used for a lot of cognition. Therefore, we have a bias towards simplicity, and we also have a bias for what is real, for what's concrete. One of the reasons I discovered that this ad using um, the airplane and the sports-related objects was so much more effective than the one using the map is because it is using, in fact, concrete, familiar objects. Because when I see this ad, when you see this ad, not only do you recognize those objects as common, but you also have a web of memories potentially attached to those uh, objects, which will be fired automatically. You also potentially have motor areas in your own brain that will become uh, ready, so to speak, to take action, to play a basketball, to run to the airport. All of that makes for a richer experience. So keep things simple keep them concrete, and don't rely so much on text to convey the meaning, because text is fundamentally cortex-centric, not reptilian-centric. Another law that really applies to all of you is the importance of understanding the sort of management that goes on in our brain when we pay attention. It turns out that there is not a uh, inverted relationship between attention and time. There is a U-shaped relationship. What does that mean? It means that we are all wired to pay more attention at the beginning and at the end, but we have a tendency, a very um, a bad tendency, to conserve and essentially uh, disengage towards the middle of a presentation or a webinar, for instance. Uh, unfortunately, when I start looking at hundreds of presentations that I see, I find that companies uh, take time to talk about their mission statements, uh, uh, possibly full description of the complete offering, and by the time they talk about their values, uh, most people have already fallen into, you know, basically a nice nap. But it is even worse than that. Most of companies will want to throw ten reasons why people should buy from, from them. And that is more than the brain can accommodate. Uh, until you go to the conclusion and people are just eager to move to the next thing and they have forgotten, long forgotten, all the reasons why they should buy from you. Now we have uh, extensively studied this pattern. It's a very hard pattern to uh, remove. However, if you create five specific segments and do not use more than 10 to 12 minutes, even though you may be trying to sell you know, millions of dollars of products and services, you will achieve better results. What you will do is achieve shorter cycles of attention and retention. And we recommend, and it's extensively described in our book, specific strategies, for instance, to earn attention first. We call that grabbing attention. And the selection of only three reasons, the most three compelling benefits you can uh, identify that are unique to you, that can create contrast between you and competition and will be ultimately uh, easy to remember and difficult to distort. Once you've produced a narrative, if you will, on just three claims, you must close repeating those claims and hope that through repetition your message will be effective. Repetition is indeed a requirement for better retention. So it's an important aspect of how you certainly structure a face-to-face -face presentation, but also if some of you are doing videos and ads, you will find this helpful. Visual is a critical aspect of how effective you can be with the reptilian brain. You see, by the time we are in front of a, of a snake, our eyes have captured the information and we don't even depend on the cortex to respond. We depend on the amygdala, which is a tiny little structure that can respond in a couple of milliseconds. It turns out that visual processing is uh, very effective at the level of the primal brain, and we recommend visual delivery over any other form of delivery, because indeed it is processed with tremendous speed and simplicity. 
Now, too many times when people produce visuals, they make it too complicated. They put too much text, which requires the participation of the cortex. And if it does, you've gone from two milliseconds to half a second of processing, which means you've slowed down 250 times the capacity that you have to influence. So stay visual in the way you convey critical information. I'm going to show you a, a, a way of trying to influence people visually. And for some, it's going to be a shocking picture. But for others, you'll quickly recognize the power of using visual warnings, particularly when you're trying to convince people not to smoke. The last piece of this model is to consider the power of emotions. Now, I don't suspect that you know, the importance of emotion is a new topic to you, but it might be new to the degree that I'm going to talk about it from a neurobiological perspective. You see, I discovered that emotions are essentially chemicals, and as such, they produce very important connections in the brain. There are 16,000 emotions that have been sort of identified as human emotions. Um, we have about as many words describing emotional states. But these eight uh, emotions are actually fundamental to a lot of responses you can expect from your customers tomorrow. I suggest that you look at the possibility of using either positive or negative emotions, understanding that we are wired to pay more attention to the negative than the positive, and we also tend to amplify the negative and we neutralize the positive. So why is fear-centric messaging so powerful? Because indeed, biologically speaking, we will pay more attention to a message that is trying to reenact or reawake fear than if we're just looking at a joy or pleasure-centric message. I'm not talking about here manipulation, which is certainly not uh, any practice that I um, either are, are or, 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 um, either recommend or, or uh, uh, would suggest is appropriate, I'm talking about the fact that as humans we go through these experiences as a function of responses in our brain and, and, and emotions are actually powerful because they convert information uh, into what is ultimately remembered and deemed significant. Emotions are truly the fuel of motion and decisions. Therefore, you have to trigger what we call emotional cocktails in order to sell or influence. It turns out that uh, those emotions actually create predictably um, different faces. And the study of facial expressions, once again, is, is very interesting in terms of how these uh, facial expressions are universal uh, in front of sadness, happiness, disgust, surprise, and otherwise. This is meant to shock you a little bit, to create a, a bit of an emotional cocktail. I like this campaign because it's very difficult to convince people to not talk on the phone and drive. We believe we can do that, yet the evidence shows we really cannot do it safely. So why not put the emotional pressure on the people that are receiving the call? Okay, so we've uh, looked at this very quickly now. Six ways to impress on the brain, the brain that you want to impress most on which has to respond emotionally, visually, uh, pays attention at the beginning and at the end mostly, uh, likes concrete, tangible information, needs contrast, and obviously is terribly self-centered. Well, we found a way to simplify this language into four steps. So the last uh, 10 minutes of this uh, webinar, before I take some questions, is, is giving you a sense of, from a business process standpoint, what you can do as early as when you go back to the office looking at sales and marketing strategy, what you can do to integrate all these principles. We believe you have to look at answering three critical questions. To the degree that the reptilian brain is so self-centered and we are fear-avoiding machines, we believe that the most important question you must answer is what pains and frustrations are um, keeping your customers awake at night? Once you've done that, it actually becomes easier and probably um, the only way you can begin to filter through the tens and thousands sometimes of reasons you think people should buy from you to down to you know, a limited number of, of three. And identifying the claims is, is, is exactly what this process is about. Once you've identified the claims, we believe that you must do everything you can to prove your case to demonstrate the difference between the value and the cost. We call that the demonstration of the gain. 
Now, paying claim gain is essentially the short uh, way of, of talking about our method. Paying claim gain tells you what to say. Uh, the delivery to the reptilian brain is still extremely important because as humans we trust and, uh, and put a lot of meaning in the way things are presented to us more so sometimes than the way um, the information is uh, on the surface. So we believe that combination of content and delivery is essential in the success of everything you do in sales and marketing. So let's cover very quickly the importance of diagnosing the pain. Clearly, once again, it's all about understanding what keeps awake, uh, what keeps uh, people awake at night. And as a researcher for 25 years, I've done a lot of investigation of what uh, um, keep uh, people awake at night. Uh, I used to ask a lot of questions about what people want and what they need until I recognized that these questions are not as helpful as understanding what people fear. Uh, and a lot of that fear-based information sometimes is considered subconscious. So you have to be able to get into intimate dialogues with your customers. If you can afford it, you can actually measure which areas of the brain are responding to fear, uh, but, but it is an extremely important aspect of how you use this model effectively. To tap into reptilian activity, you have to uh, look at fear and pain. Now, I'll give you some quick examples of how this method actually does work. If you're all uh, in the pizza business, you may think that um, you know, to be more successful, you would have to look at, you know, needs and wants people have on, on, the, on the pizza, when in fact research has shown um, that the biggest frustration happens to be not knowing when the pizza will show up. Well, Domino's, you know, decades ago, was able to identify this pain and, and shape their entire strategy around being pizza delivery experts, uh, which made them the most successful pizza company in the world. Even Starbucks is not really in the coffee business because they've long identified that they are indeed solving a pain, and that pain is how do you transition from home to work? They believe they are a third place. They are sort of a decompression chamber that helps people migrate or transition from home to work. The question I would like for you all to um, explore after this webinar and with your teams is is sure you probably have a pretty good idea of what your products are, but are you clear, are you aligned on what the top pains of your customers are? Once you are, you have an opportunity to actually communicate using pain. We call that pain-centric messaging. And this is a very good example from Sony. For Sony, you know, it's not the fact that they have a projector that's interesting. It's the fact that they have the lightest projector. And therefore, reenacting what pain and frustration people may have when we travel is triggering more emotions, more movement towards the product than if they were just featuring um, the specs of the product. Now, again, once you've identified pain points, your uh, next job is to select and carefully do so the top three reasons why uh, you can solve those pains better than anybody else. And those reasons have to indeed contrast you and competition, or if you don't have competition, they have to contrast why people should uh, you know, not uh, stand in, in, the, in the neutral mode, but actually make a move towards your product. And I'll keep using this uh, projector example because it's actually quite uh, uh, easy to uh, explain the value of good claims. Once um, uh, Sony picked being the lightest projector, Epson decided that they were going to be the brightest projector. Because with other projector, you can see the world's smartest man, but with an Epson, he's even brighter. We've identified that there are three qualities you must attempt to, uh, to reach with every single one of your claims. We call that making top claims. The T stands for therapeutic, the O stands for original, and the P stands for provable. You have also to recognize that the speed at which people will identify your claims matter, uh, matter a great deal. For instance, um, when Sony says we're the portable projector, with this ad, they're using a visual um, um, you know, strategy to accelerate your understanding of that claim as well as in focus is able to achieve 
um, visual understanding of the fact that they are targeting um, the easiest uh, projector claim uh, rather than forcing you to read. And it strikes me that when I look on websites and print ads, it's extremely rare that I can decode the meaning and the understanding of the claims of a particular brand without uh, any cognitive involvement. And I think there is a huge, huge power gained from clarifying your claims and, and finding a visual expression uh, uh, for them. Once you've done the difficult job of, of selecting and picking your claims, you're now ready to do what we call the demonstration of the game. And that part is fundamentally trying to explain and defend um, the credibility, the, the tangibility of your claims. Uh, this model of, of looking at financial, strategic, and personal aspects of your claim has proven to be extremely valuable. Financial for the brain is any form of augmentation of resources, therefore it, it's actually quite easy for the brain to understand financial uh, value. Um, strategic is more qualitative or uh, best expressed in terms of risk assessment. And personal, obviously, is to, to which degree can you say your products or services are making people feel better, happier, less stressed. So uh, for every time you have a claim, see whether or not it's easy for you to uh, peel uh, the onion of the value. Uh, what is financial? What's strategic? What's personal? And by the time you've stacked up, uh, all of that, are you able to very quickly convince that there is a huge difference between what you're asking people to pay and what you're giving them? And I'm going to leave this model with you um, that, that, that helps you prove your case in ways that is extraordinarily effective with the brain. It is the idea that there are actually four ways to convince, but ways that are better to convince at the level of the brain than others, starting with the most effective, which is to use customer stories. Because customer stories establish the fact that you have already delivered value, they are not objectionable. And therefore, you must maximize the use of stories throughout your ability to uh, defend your claims. A demo is another strategy that is quite successful if indeed you are able to sample what you can do for people in the present and from that we typically are able to predict that the future will be as good as the present, right? Data is a strategy that is often used but is difficult and complex for the brain unless you visualize data and producing vision statements is often used uh, but it's a very poor and very weak strategy because you're trying to suggest um, that you understand what the future is uh, going to bring, and for the brain, nothing is more risky, more uncertain than the future. I'll give you some example of each of those technology. Once again, a testimonial is the strongest form of proof because you do it from past. A demo, such as a cooking demo, is a sample from which our brain will produce a deduction, an inference, that typically will be Yes, I have confidence because what I see did work, therefore it's going to work for me. Uh, a proof through data is best delivered um, through visuals. I found recently this very effective way of trying to visualize what $150 trillion worth of debt is. Um, for most Americans, it's been pretty clear that the number doesn't resonate. Well, it doesn't re resonate to their reptilian brain until you understand the massive volume of banknotes this represents. This is actually a, a, a clever and, and uh, um, funny uh, way to use visions, vision visuals um, to um, help position the future capacity of, of, of a firm such as a law firm. So to conclude in the last few minutes, what I want to leave you with is the fact that we've in fact um, established what we call a neural map you can uh, access the PDF of this visual through our website, salesbrain.com, which is um, a way of navigating important decisions that, that you must make to maximize your ability to convince and sell. We've covered the left part of this poster, which is recognizing the importance of the brain layers, the importance of six stimuli, the importance of four steps. But to the right of the poster, you will find that we've identified um, different techniques, different ways to build a presentation, 
uh, that involves grabbers, claims, strong visuals, proofs, and so on, as well as multiple techniques, and I've mentioned a few, such as using you, that are meant to augment your capacity to influence. Uh, I encourage you to um, access the documentation, but right now I'd love to take some questions uh, and, uh, and, and bring this to another level of uh, interactivity. Okay, well, Christoph, this is uh, Tom Hackle, and on behalf of the entire Goldmail team, I can tell you here at Goldmail there are a lot of computers that are on the webinar as well. Um, as you know, we, we are deep into the process uh, with you, and, and it's changing the way we do business. And um, I hope that everyone on the call could see that there's a lot of a lot of subject matter here. So one thing I wanted to recommend to everybody uh, just, just before I get to the questions, and this is not uh, something that I've ever done before, but I want to highly recommend that uh, you guys um, do this. Is yeah, if you could change me, I'm gonna I'm gonna make sure that uh, you remember that there's a book here. Um, you can get it on Amazon. Um, I downloaded it on Kindle when I first got it because I wanted it right away. Um, it's incredible value. It's a real quick read, but you got to read it a few times. With all of the material that's covered in here. The examples that can really start getting you to the next level and get it to all of your team members. So I just want to make sure that, that you look at the book. So Christoph, I'm going to start off with some great questions. Some of them are a little bit more technical than I'm even capable of uh, asking, I think. On the, there's obviously some PhDs on the call as well. But the first and most basic question is this, Christoph. Um, a lot of people, you, you've made an incredible, uh, 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 obviously, an argument uh, to the reptilian brain, the survival mechanism and pain. Yet oftentimes people, you hear it all the time, that people are afraid to go into those places to sell pain. And if it's so effective and, and it's used so widely, why is it that you feel that some people, maybe people on this call, feel that that isn't them, that they can't sell pain to a client? Or do you have any comments about that? Yes, I, I, I see and hear about this um, objection all the time. And, and I agree that a lot of ads are extremely distasteful. Uh, distasteful, and and a lot of um, uh, ways you're being approached sometimes to to buy something. It feels very uh, manipulating. So I'm not uh, I'm not um, suggesting that uh, uh, pain will always work if you don't do the homework. What we've discovered through the work that we've done for thousands of companies is there is actually a lot of work ahead of the production of the message which I have to say a lot of advertising agencies may or may not do, and therefore the, the quality and the relevance of their messages or the quality of the relevance of the training that is done for salespeople is compromised. And if you're not hitting the right pain points, yes, you will not uh, obviously get the response that you expect. So it does take work. It's, uh, it's subtle. Uh, I believe that uh, people in the organizations that we work with take responsibility for creating a message that doesn't compromise uh, with uh, it doesn't compromise integrity ethics the idea is not to is really not to manipulate it's truly to to create that that laser beam quality of communication that needs to exist initially at the level of the reptilian brain for the rest of the brain to light up so it, it's a subtle difficult uh, balance to achieve, and yes, you're right, many of us have had poor experiences as consumers, but I can tell you that if it's done properly, it does work. Well, that, that's a great answer, and I think in one of our other conversations we've had over the past, you mentioned like a doctor, so you can't make up the, the pain, it can't be fabricated, but a doctor asks the questions to really understand the pain so he can help you, and as salespeople, whether it's consulting services or products, at the end of the day, we're trying to help people. We're trying to get the product to the people to make them better. Um, the second question here, which I really like, there's a lot of great questions. I don't know that we're going to get to all of them, but let me read this one. A lot of new sales psychology is saying that, quote, find the pain is inadequate. You have to elicit aspirations and visions of a better world or a future state beyond the elimination of pain. In part, this is because once the immediate pain is assaged, big word for me, there's new pain. Comments. 
Yes, again, um, what I've learned in my own um, sort of um, experience as a marketing researcher for 25 years is that um, it's one thing to project what it is that you um, are able to do to to bring more you know success more pleasure more 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 money um, but it's more abstract for the brain when you do just that than if you anchor first on on what people are missing and what they're not able to experience you see for the brain calculation of value the term in cognitive neuroscience is, is referred to as the utility of behavior or the utility of a decision is always is always a, a computation of a difference and and too many times I see my clients who have wonderful products wonderful services and they're just showing the moon so to speak but they're not reminding people are still on the earth and I, and I believe that for the brain the, the best assessment of value comes from the difference between the vision and ultimately the pleasure and the relief of the pain and the pain and I have studies that demonstrate level of attention, level of commitment, much higher by anchoring on the pain. And, and yes, I know it goes against a lot of studies, but you know, again, you have to understand a lot of books in sales psychology are you know, over 20 years old. Uh, and, and the fMRI and EEG have been used only in the last 10 years. So a lot of what I'm preaching and teaching and recommending people use is indeed um, potentially against uh, some uh, some traditional uh, approaches. That that is uh, that is a, a a great response to it. You know, part of what I was listening when I read that question, part of me when I was looking at the end of the the uh, the four compelling ways with the client testimonials and obviously the demo, and the last one was vision. And I was thinking about that question, even though, yes, once I get out of the current pain, there might be a new pain, but I was thinking about that reptilian brain being in the moment of surviving and focusing on the current pain. Um, so that might have something to do with it as well, just in practical terms of what we can digest. The next question here is more general. Um, it's about insurance, but um, I think you can apply it more generally. Most businesses today are in survival mode, and motivating them to open to be open and to talk about insurance has been difficult. How, to, how do you establish pain? So they're in survival mode, they're not focused, we want to solve their problem with insurance. How do we start that conversation, I guess, and establish that pain with, some, with, a, with a client if they're not really ready to do it? Or, or I guess that's really the question. Well, whether it's insurance or any other service, you, you, we are in, in you know, difficult um, economic times, and um, and that's why, as a matter of fact, uh, this model I think can be so relevant because uh, people don't do what what makes sense necessarily or what's rationalized. They do what what ultimately is is uh, is is produced more emotionally and more instinctually. Uh, and on top of that, I should have maybe insisted even more on this. Um, most of those emotional, instinctual, you know, responses are are happening below our level of consciousness. Therefore, we're just catching up in our cortex all the time. So, the best way you can uh, engage with your customer initially before you sell is indeed to be able to uh, create this pain dialogue. Uh, and it's not always easy to do it with your own company. Sometimes you need to hire, you know third-party companies that will do this for you, a diagnosis of the pain is having a open, uh, unfiltered, uh, open question type dialogue with your customers and have them talk about, for instance, insurance in the context of, you know, how insurance is relevant to their current situation. If, if insurance is indeed not relevant to their state of survival, you're not going to sell insurance. You know, I mean, I mean, the point uh, of, of a lot of what we do is to, to also to recognize that you cannot sell to anybody. And, and you should walk away if indeed the level of pain intensity or pain uh, urgency as it relates to your product is low. I mean, so many times we have such a bad experience of selling is because people are making the assumption that we have a pain and we don't. So it's about also filtering, doing a better job, on those uh, that are 
most attracted and most uh, ready to accept our message. Yeah, that's, uh, that's great. The next one here, uh, I'm going to kind of combine a couple of questions here. Um, one says, this question is a practical question. It says, um, I work, o I work over the, uh, in the computer mostly in B2B sales over the computer, so they're doing webinars and whatnot, often speaking with non-decision makers. Is there much variability in the process when making initial contact to a potential client? So here's more of a cold call situation, initial contact. Am I using the same methodology in the prospecting? And then the second kind of adjoining question was, uh, people's attention spans are so short today, and we're living in a time-starved world. So how does this all integrate when you're trying to put all this together into a way that results in sales? Yes, so the, the reference to the cold um, uh, comment, cold call comment, um, uh, clearly at any level of interaction that you have with someone, you, you have to apply the, the, the principles of, of this model. In other words, if you are indeed talking to someone who is just a referral source, then, then you can't ignore the fact that they have completely different pains than potentially the the, the ultimate buyer. Uh, maybe their pains as referral sources or middle management are that they want to shine in front of of their uh, of the other constituencies. So, so the, the the level of fine tuning, if you will, is 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 higher in our approach than than an other approach. We don't recommend just using the you know, same template for everybody. We recommend customizing the way you approach your audience based on the patterns of, of the pains in their brains. And if you do this, you will find initially it's a little, um, you know, maybe cumbersome, but you, it's like training a muscle in your, in your own brain. And you will find that you will enjoy uh, doing this pain claim gain sequence and that indeed it will optimize everything you do to get through um, the noise. And to go back to the second question, yes, we are bombarded by information, we use multiple devices. Our our screen time, which is now sort of a terminology to describe the amount of time we spend in front of a screen, be it a computer, an iPad, or a telephone, is is close to ten hours a day. Uh, in this kind of environment, our brain, which is very much still a, a caveman brain, has no option but to disregard and shut down attention as a form of protection. Our brain is not wired to process all this messaging. And, and the only way you can succeed is recognize these patterns that I described to all of you. The visual bias that we have, so don't expect you know, just pure email um, to, to, uh, to be effective. That's why, as you know, Tom, I'm a big fan of your platform, because it does promote the use of visual um, uh, you know, visual uh, communication. The use of a human voice is adding a layer of, of connection that, that we enjoy as humans, which goes beyond the robots. So all of these different approach do matter and will make a difference, uh, more so than um, trying to describe what you do, do it logically, and, and, and wait for purchase orders. Uh, thanks for that uh, answer. That and and clearly one of the reasons we're such a big fan of what you do is it, it flat out works when you can stimulate connection through pictures and voice. And so if you are in telemarketing or webinars, you should be considering that, no question. Um, here's a question which is a little a little off off the 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 main subject matter, but I think it's on everyone's minds. And it says, what's the role of media in influencing to the reptilian brain specifically? Uh, how does social media in particular influence the emotional or reptilian brain? Um, and how is that you know, all coming together with what you're doing? Um, do you have the rest of the afternoon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Someone, said why, someone said they're running out of time and they want to get their question answered. But this is one where we're going to have to like, close it up. But I think, again, buy the book and start the research. But uh, if you could uh, put a little bit on that, that would be great. And then we'll do one more question. Yes, I mean social media is a great um, interest of mine, and as you know, I'm finishing my my PhD in media psychology, so I'm a great student and researcher of of all media, um, and and uh, and and yes, 
there's some interesting studies that come from um, uh, the neuromarketing or neuroeconomics uh, space showing that um, you know on, on some level we, we use all these tools we, we uh, tend to hype uh, initially how much we need them. There's sort of a, a trend right now talking about how people get are starting to get bored from social media. Um, but but we crave the we crave human connection and we crave the ability to um, to to share a narrative. You know, it's a very self centered aspect of our behavior. We we want to feel important. We want to feel that we matter. And we matter more when we're able to show how many friends we have and how many cool uh, videos we listen and so on. So it's a very, it's it's still very reptilian, but it's a technological version of a reptilian, uh, you know, manifestation, if you will. Uh, as far as news media in general is concerned, I'm sure you've all noticed, and it's a sad reality in in media, that they are no longer really that interested in content. They are essentially interested in in disrupting and grabbing your attention. Um, therefore, news is no longer about what is happening, but uh, how could it potentially impact your life now? So all the visuals, all the narrative is about triggering reptilian activity. Now, as far as I know, it's it's working, and and we all have in a way to protect ourselves, and that's why in. in in what I do, promoting neuromarketing, I believe I also try to protect people from being um, hooked on uh, strategies that that are that are manipulative, that are indeed trying to uh, grab your attention and rob you from your attention. I would not expect people in business with integrity, with ethics, to do that. Uh, but I'm afraid this this has not uh, been the, the priority and consideration of a lot of media today. That was uh, that was a, another great answer, and like you said, it could be it could be for an hour. Or so um, all of you that stayed on this uh, uh, with a weekend approaching here, uh, just an incredible response in terms of the number of attendees and the people stayed on. The meeting is going to be archived. Everyone that registered for the webinar will get a link to this. It'll probably be on two, end of Tuesday. Uh, you will get a link to this so you can watch it. Um, I, I was going to do one more question, but I think in the spirit of time, uh, we'll wrap it up here. Um, Christoph, we cannot thank you enough for, for being our thought leader uh, here. It is incredible material. It is very practical. If I, I read some of the questions, there were so many more that we will try to get to those um, on responses here afterwards. But most importantly, the overall reaction we got from people is, wow. So thank you for sharing the insights on this. As you said, you can dig as deep as you want. Um, in this, uh, I recommended the book because, again, it's such a pleasurable and simple read. And all of you, again, look into your uh, your emails. You will get the uh, link to the webinar. And we truly thank you, Christoph, and obviously on behalf of all of SalesBain and Patrick as well for doing this for us. It's a core part of our evangelizing in terms of what people need to be thinking about to get better. And I think that last comment is we are in a time-starved world. People want to get to it quickly. It has to be organized. And probably the thing that hit me the most about what you said today was how many of us get to the presentation after people have already fallen asleep. So everybody, have a great weekend. Patrick, thanks for influencing us so much. And thank you for what you've just shared with all of our clients and the friends of Goldmail. Uh, we really welcome. appreciate it. All right. Take care. Thank you guys so much.